Dear colleagues, dear students, and also dear audience online, welcome to our annual lecture of international scholars at Eastern AU Faculty of Education in 2022. My name is Chen Hongye from the International and Comparative Education Institute at Eastern AU, and I'm going to be the host of this afternoon panel. As already the professor uh, Chen Shangyue mentioned in this morning panel, the initial purpose of this uh, well, um, panel is to present our appointed a distinguished professor at ECNU and invite them to well, deliver or present their recent research uh, um, in their special, uh, specialty and further promote our Chinese educational research in a general sense. In this morning, actually, we have a very uh, interesting and three uh, inspired speeches. It's ranged from different topics like the innovative education, shadow education, in uh, cross culture comparison, as we are at the school improvement based on uh, uh, evidenced research. So I guess the audience might benefit a lot from these intellectual uh, discussions. And this afternoon, we will continue our talk discussions. And the talks may be arranged from childhood to cultural psychology, as we are at the anthropologic dimension in educational field. And guess, and I, I believe that you will uh, have more inspired perspective uh, we are, mm, from different kinds of scholars. So uh, each speech, uh, in this afternoon, we include a keynote speech for 25 minutes, and then followed by 25, uh, followed by 15 minutes discussions uh, with the our um, invited scholars from different universities. So first of all, um, let us uh, invite. Uh, so first of all, let, let's invite. Uh, as far as I see from the schedule, the first uh, uh, speaker should be Jean Vassino. Me? <laughs> Sorry, I need to check. No, please open open my video. I cannot I cannot connect with video. Please open it for me. Ah. And Vina will actually start. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, so, uh, Professor, let me see but, who is she. Uh, uh, slides, would you please just uh, 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 close your slides? Because our, our first uh, uh, speaker is Professor Jean Vassino. Huh? Yes, but uh, uh, we have uh, we agreed to, in making a joint presentation today. Uh, me <gasps> and Professor Vassino, and along with Luca Tateo, who is not here, but his work is you know has I, I, is part is part of the network. So. Uh, we are Professor Jan Bassiner, me, myself, we will have uh, a joint presentation, uh, as you oh, see okay. on right now. So I'm starting and then Professor Bassiner will, uh, will continue and then I will end the presentation, this morning presentation, this afternoon for okay. you presentation. So it's okay, uh, everything. Good. Well, nice. One shot. Okay, then <laughs> I will give a very brief introduction about to you both, huh? <laughs> Okay, then uh, first, our professor Masiko, or you can, um, Pina Masiko, she's worked at the Development Educational Psychology at the University of Sanano, uh, Italia. She is an experienced research in culture psychology, and she is also the editor in chief of the book series in Culture Psychology of Education, Latin American Voice, Voices, Integrated Psychology and Humanity. Um, and uh, Professor Jean Vassena, uh, Vassena, he is a professor at the Alban University of Denmark. He has been a visiting professor in Brazil, Japan, Australia, Estonia, etc. Uh, well, he has been uh, the most uh, or foremost cultural psychologist in the world for the last 20 uh, 30 years. He is research, his research field range from the developmental psychology, especially in the analyze, uh, analyze of the mother-child interaction patterns, and then he gradually shifted to the cultural psychology and cultural organization of human cognitive. In the talk they were going to uh, well, uh, talk with is the seek root of cultural psychology uh, of the education. 
NG, he or the both uh, will explore the theoretic knowledge, methodology, instance, and culture situated meaningful interventions in Chinese education context for promoting a culture approaches to educational psychology. So please, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, as I said, I will start uh, and on behalf, first on behalf of uh, Professor Jan Balsiner, uh, Professor Luca Tate, me, myself, we really want to thank you for this invitation uh, to be part of this event, uh, which is, I think, an, an extremely interesting moment to summarize the fruitful collaboration between our universities and uh, our lecture uh, trying exactly to go and to acknowledge the, the, um, the activities that has been done in the last few years, not just this year, uh, because that has been a very productive uh, uh, period of time. In, the collaboration with NCNU has been started by Jan Valsiner some years ago already. Uh, and then he went many times and uh, uh, you know, period of time with uh, uh, lecturing and, uh, and uh, discussion with uh, uh, Xiao Wen, Professor Xiao Wen and then Hemin group uh, of students there. So uh, Jan started, inaugurated this uh, uh, connection and then the, the caravan, I would say the group of people uh, after, after a period of time become, uh, grow, uh, become bigger and bigger. And, then, and now we have, uh, a, a sort of, uh, you know, large group of people that are in connection with you and, and, and has been very, benefit, very beneficial uh, for us as well. So at the moment, uh, this presentation today uh, is, is trying to make a synthesis of what has been done in the last four or five years of before and after, I would say, the pandemic. Uh, the title of this presentation, The Silk Road of Cultural Psychology of Education. And uh, yeah, this is a sort of map of uh, some of the, let's say, the more active uh, point in this large net uh, that connect uh, China with the other countries all over the world, especially Denmark, but also more, uh, Italy, of course, Brazil, Luxembourg, and also uh, Norway. Uh, because Professor Luca Tadeo, he moved from, uh, uh, he changed the, the, the workplace from Denmark to Oslo. So Oslo is now the center of the scene, as you are going to see uh, quite soon. So what we have done in the last year is uh, meetings uh, in, in China uh, and also in other places. So we have um, going and fro, we visited you a couple of times, and then uh, uh, we received people from China in Europe and in Latin America also. So uh, in, before the pandemic, we established a center of excellence uh, based in Shanghai uh, that connect all the university, the same university we have seen in the previous map. And the, the center of excellence is called IBEF, Idea for Basic Education of the Future. So it's an interna international center of excellence on innovative learning, teaching, environmental practices uh, where we want to really uh, understand the way in which we, uh, we, can, we can find a local solution to global challenges when it comes to education in this new era. Uh, we are facing a lot of troubles and the, these troubles are becoming even more critical after the pandemic, but uh, we cannot really simply transfer to one solution uh, found in, in a place in another place. So we really need to uh, to have a clear vision of what are the challenges today and how we can find the solution that are most suitable for the uh, specific cult social cultural setting. So the, Excellent, the main partner institution of the Center of Excellence is the IBEF, is, of course, is China Normal University with the leading uh, organization and then Orburg University, University of Salerno, Federal University of Brazil, of Bahia in Brazil, and University of Luxembourg. And we have done already a lot of things that you may found um, uh, publication that have been uh, already uh, produced a lot of publication and then a lot of activities that are launched into this website. And maybe I will send you because the lack of time, I, do not, I cannot go into that in details. This is a very nice picture of the very first meeting in Shanghai when a bunch of uh, uh, Luxembourg students 
has been sent literally to, uh, to Shanghai um, because this was the pilot, uh, the very first uh, experiences of what is now considered the most advanced, advanced model of international students' mobility that I'm going to present to you and uh, has been literally um, originated uh, thanks to the collaboration with NCNU. So here you see uh, Chinese students uh, welcoming Luxembourg students and uh, uh, Professor Hemin has done an incredible work in, uh, no, in welcoming in, in the preparation and in, the, in, the, in, the, in accompanying the students there in Shanghai. The idea is the very simple but very powerful. It's called the research tandems, meaning um, we are going to, let's say, a couple creating sort of uh, uh, peer uh, in between Chinese and uh, other international students um, in order to work on the same subjects and together they are going to publish. I will be more detailed a bit later, but this is the, the, the second step of uh, the research tandem project originated in Shanghai and then uh, has been has been let's say tried out the first time between Luxembourg and China, and then we have enlarged uh, we have making a larger network uh, having Oslo as a leading uh, institution uh, with Professor Luca Tateo who got a grant that are right now um, in place, and uh, the second phase of research tandem include a University of uh, Oslo, of course, Brazil and China. Unfortunately, Indian University dropped out because of the pandemic, so it has been uh, extremely hard for them. You know, absolutely, you know what, how hard it is to work in the pandemic. But uh, this is the current state of art in, the, in a few weeks, some few weeks, so at the beginning of 2023, some students from Shanghai are leaving Shanghai to go to Oslo. Some students are uh, from Oslo are going to Brazil and vice versa. Brazilian students are going to Oslo. So the pillar of this uh, research um, tandem activity is the following. Create a group of people that work together on a joint uh, object. Uh, because we we found out that the combination of different perspectives uh, might be of great beneficial for both the host person and the, and the travelers coming in the, as a foreigner into the new place because the people that are an outsider may uh, let's say um, let's say may have some question may have some curiosity, may have some naivete. So his or her perspective may, uh, let's see, uh, unveil uh, the, what is taken for granted already by the local person and vice versa. The local person may help the people coming from abroad to understand the symbolic, the, the, the codes or the, what is already tacit and as, acquired, as, assumed as the basis for the ordinary activities. So we have done quite a, an intense work and we have already published uh, quite a lot on that. Uh, the activities that are now in place and uh, uh, let's say starting right now, starting and will continue over the 2023 is the research tandem activities and then the accelerator seminar. People will converge a certain point in time and to, during 2023 in Oslo to, to work together to um, you know, uh, accelerate the process of academic writings, and then we will have uh, a publication, uh, international publication out of it. We can prove that this has been already um, uh, very productive. Uh, those are two of, of the many publications. One has been led by Xuan Xuan Su, who is uh, uh, now um, uh, already a doctor, doctor uh, and he has been uh, in, uh, in, in Holborg University for her, some years for her doctoral uh, period, for her doctoral activities under the supervision of uh, uh, Luca Tateo and Professor Jan Walsiner. And this is the book that has been published, published by Springer, by the way, so an international publisher on the activity made uh, in the first pilot. 
uh, activities when the people from Luxembourg went to uh, Shanghai. So they have done a lot of, of work and uh, the outcomes of this work has been published in a, a very nice book. I helped uh, to edit this book together with Shan Shuan. And then most re more recently, uh, an, um, uh, an article on uh, integrative psychological and behavioral science uh, where there is a, the, we, uh, Luca Plateo, me, myself, Professor Hemin, and our colleagues from Brazil, we, we work on, we write, wrote on University Without Borders, this, the idea of no limits, no frontiers when it comes to uh, knowledge construction at, at, academic, at the academic level. So this has been what we have done and we are continuing to do uh, despite the pandemic, I would say. So it started before 2017, it has, uh, you know, it, we continue working on that. And, uh, and now we are already some horizon of activity in, uh, ahead. I leave the stage to Professor Jan Valsine for, for the main part of the lecture. And then I will be back for, for some theory or for some empirical aspects and a new direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pina, for the nice introduction. I'm extremely pleased to be back to Shanghai, even if I'm afar. I'm at this moment sitting in my hotel lobby in Frankfurt, and after I finish, I have to rush to the airport to travel to Salerno to meet Pina there. So what is cultural psychology and what can it do constructively for educational psychology? Next slide, please. Oh, I can do it myself now. Next slide, yeah. Well, psycho first of all, there are some basic starting points which we should not forget. First, all psychological phenomena exist on the, at the border of personal environment, not in my mind, but between my mind and the environment. Secondly, psychology is therefore a science of human liminal constructions, the borderline constructions. Education in this sense is a general term for student-teacher relationship. Next slide. And this is exactly the issue of ambivalence in the relation with the world out there, world that we are here. A teacher deals with a world out there which is filled with students, but has to create a specific solution to the ambivalence between his or her way of looking at the world, educational look, and the pupil's way of dealing with a new coming education. The pupils have to deal with a very interesting aspect they're entering the new world of teachers, new world of adults from their childish perspectives, but the childish perspective becomes very soon an adult perspective. Next slide, please. So cultural psychology is a very special new branch of psychology that is on the intersection of anthropology, psychology, sociology, philosophy, and so on. Therefore, it has an integrative quality that other areas of psychology does not have. So next slide. So <clears throat> historically, cultural psychology has appeared three times. First in 1850s, after 19th century roots in Europe, yeah? in terms of worker theology in Germany, Maurice Lutz of Scheimsteintal, and also later with Wilhelm Wundt, and second time in culture and personality tradition in cultural anthropology. No, since 1990s, we try the third time. That is notion of cultural psychology where culture is within every person. So we are not parts of a particular society only, that we are all part, you are all parts of China, but in actually the being Chinese is deeply ingrained in your own mind as culture. So culture is inside the person. There are many persons in a society but every person has ingrained in their mind the culture. Next please. So cultural psychology today consists of a variety of perspectives. It's not monological. It is in many ways, they all ex exit from the mainstream psychology, which is that of rats and computer programs. Rather it looks at living streams, driving, meaning, making, feeling and into all kinds of intentional active beings who construct higher meanings. In, they create values, they create art and so on. And they reproduce this through joint reconstruction with the next generation. Next one. 
So we looked very briefly here, which is one aspect of this general cultural psychology, which is mine, which is that of semiotic mediation dynamics. What does it mean? Human beings make signs. They create signs as they proceed in the life courses in irreversible time. You cannot turn the time back. You can only move forward in time. And in that process, you create different meanings with the help of which you live your life. These signs form temporary hierarchies that regulate other signs and then conduct. So my particular moral commitment to something regulates all of my concrete behavior in everyday setting. These hierarchies can be demolished at any moment by signs that are part of it. That is important. This gives dynamic flexibility to the sign construction. Next one, please. In our lives, we move ahead and around. We move on the path of a highway, we move in city in Shanghai. We also go around the tree and so on. <coughs> Our experience includes construction of meaning on the move. So next one, please. This is a very general methodological picture of what kind of research one has to do in cultural psychology. You see the person and environment relations in the center. <coughs> But this relation is guided by others, by society, by different people in society, as well as by oneself. <coughs> Next one, please. This leads to the use of a very general minimal structure, to which comes from German language, Gegenstand. It's a minimal structure of psychological processes, which implies opposites. I say this is beautiful, and while saying that imply it could have been ugly, or this is music, it could have been noise. In other sense, the oppositions are made culturally in my own mind. Next one, please. So you see as a sign hierarchy emerges here, the semiotic process leads to creating the sign complexes, which flavor or give new, new meaning to experiences. The ongoing experience suddenly becomes totally new. Going into school makes a child feel that I'm a school child. I'm in school. I'm very proud of it. Next one. <laughs> the signs that to generate in time have two functions. They regulate the particular conduct at the present moment, as you see, as involved in the act. But they also send messages to the future. They feed forward to the unknown future. The unknown future is always there. All efforts of education are basically working towards the unknown future. You give children a particular educational experience now, but its actual function is in the future when they have grown up. Next one, please. So this also happens at different levels of gen abstracting different signs. Here you see a place where the different four levels of signs are operating, only two of them, level two and level three, are accessible to verbal access. Level four is what I call hyper-generalized level, which actually is not talkable. You cannot talk about it, but you live by it. The general aspect of values is so deeply ingrained in human mind that human being cannot live otherwise but by the non-verbal understanding of my place in the world. Next one, please. So there are theoretical aspects of the border in cultural psychology there are of course, and this, this is a transfer to Pina's part very soon, the arbitrariness of borders allows us to negotiate, reorganize and modify them. This is a very important point, Pina will elaborate. And there's a tragic, tragic nature of the borders and processes that Pina will also elaborate. So I have to finish now. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I have to rush to the airport. But I, I wish you nice continuation of exactly your festivities at the end of the year and happy new year to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, let, let me continue on exactly on these aspects of border. Jan uh, uh, Vassiner already introduced theoretically. And I will uh, add some uh, uh, first some uh, axiomatic aspects and then I will continue with some empirical. Uh, um, let's say, uh, example in order to see how we try to apply this uh, notion of borders 
and, uh, and uh, liminality in our culture and why in the cultural psychology of education, uh, meaning the uh, psychology of education uh, under the perspective of cultural psychology of semiotic mediation as Jan Walsinger has been uh, briefly introduced this morning. So uh, why we need uh, why we need to to work on uh, uh, borders? Uh, unfortunately, Professor Basinger, as you see, has been uh, you know with us just for a part. It's early morning here in Europe, and uh, we have already planned, but we really wanted to be part of this event. So we arranged in a way that help, uh, helps him uh, to be part at least for for a moment in this event, and then I will continue. So um, as you have seen in this, uh, in, this meet, in this previous, let's say, be back on, the, on one of the previous um, uh, already example here, he tried out. Uh, there is uh, this one, oh, sorry, uh, back on, on one of the slides, Professor Barsiner here. Right, so um, recently, uh, we have very much focused in cultural psychology and in cultural psychology of education, especially on the notion of borders as the most interesting place where to understand the human psyche. So um, we found out that borders and the limits, frontiers are the most interesting place to investigate in order to understand how our psychological uh, process, how we, you know, we think, how we make decision, how we inter interact with, with other people. So uh, the notion of borders of, uh, of or, or more generally speaking, border zone has, has acquired a very crucial, a central uh, place in the recent uh, and most advanced reflection in cultural psychology of education. When it comes to border in mind and in society, when uh, the usual thing, usual, um, usually we think of something extremely sharp, extremely uh, clear, extremely you know well defined while is is not that case it's very rare uh, the case in which the border has been made only by a line in most of the case in society in the real life but also in our mind border are more like border zone so there is a space in between one thing and another thing there is a space in between one limit and another limit there is a space not only one time let's say line but there is a sort of extension territory if there is some extension it means that this is not a border but is a border zone means meaning that might be uh, elements that move from one to another that are, let's say, uh, that it requires time to be crossed. And in this time and space in between, many, many, many things may happen. I will give you right now an, an example of uh, um, what I have been done by using the notion of border when it comes to education, okay? So it's, despite now it seems extremely uh, theoretical, you will see quite soon uh, an example that like, let, us let us understand the, let's say, the, uh, the heuristic power of uh, uh, border when it comes to education. So uh, just back to where Jan Walsiner stopped, border are somehow um, an, uh, made by, on the basis of agreements, so they are arbitrary. They are not just... Uh, uh, let's say something that we mm, is a, a human artifact. So if there are, those are human artifacts, they might be negotiated, reorganized, modified any moment. It depends on the, uh, let's say, the human uh, activity and agency. So it's, uh, it's not just something, a given, that we cannot modify it at all. On the contrary, uh, despite borders sounds like something fixed, uh, they are instead uh, changeable and, and might undergo negotiation 
and modification. So also uh, the borders, they have, a, they have a triadic nature. So what does it mean that it requires um, people that made borders, but also the notion of temporality. So borders that happens also in time and moving from one part to the border to another part of the border means moving on in time also from the past to the future. Let me give you uh, an additional, let's say, aspects, theoretical aspects, and then we move to the empirical, to the empirical part. Um, in my recent uh, work on borders, I have uh, really strived a lot trying to transform the notion of borders from uh, the sharp line to the border zone, but I was unsatisfied because still border zone sounds extremely rigid. While to me, um, we should reconsider the border zone as, as a social membranes. Membranes is membrane are um, a biological metaphor. Uh, we may borrow from the biology. Membrane are the, the, the what, uh, let's say, cover a cell. And the membrane, the cell membrane, allow things to go in and out. So it's really based on permeability, which is something that we should consider when it comes to human being. So, but what kind of social membrane we found in the uh, school system, for instance? What are those places in between when it comes to education? There are many. I'm going to show you one, just one example of uh, social membrane that students at any, in any place of the world experience every day when it, 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 he or she goes from school, from family to school. This is uh, an ordinary entrance uh, gate of uh, a school in South Italy, close to my place. This is a primary school in a, um, a little city nearby. I'm in Italy right now, I'm speaking from Italy. And this is, a, um, this is an ordinary uh, uh, school in an ordinary place, in an ordinary uh, city in the south of Italy. And this is the main gate, this one, one uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in the pictures on, the, on your uh, left side of the screen. So students are, uh, every day they leave the, the family, they leave the home, their home, and they go to school. So, and they enter the gate, and there is uh, this space in between that I, uh, you know, you may see in the next, in the, in the, in the picture on the, your right uh, side of the screen, where in this case, there are yellow strip on the floor. So um, when I visited this school some years ago before the pandemic, I was very much impressed by, and I got cur curious of this yellow strip in, uh, on, uh, in the, into the curtain heart of the school, right? So this is the main gate, then there is the main entrance. Uh, this, this is a space in between filled by yellow uh, strips. And I was wondering, why and why they need this yellow strip? At the beginning, I, uh, I misunderstood that I found, I thought that this uh, yellow strip was for parking the car. But uh, when I was there and I see the early morning entrance routine, it was eight in the morning, I went there to make my observation and, uh, and uh, I see I saw though this space in between the gate, so the regularly street public space uh, outside the school and the school entrance, this space in between filled by uh, students that are grouped in uh, every morning on the basis of the, their class. Uh, so they are obliged, they are invited, they gently pushed to to, to occupy the space uh, that are uh, attributed or that are uh, for each of the classes of that school. So 
second B, 2A, first D, those are the classes. So each student go and occupy only and only that small space, small square, which is the square assigned to his or, to his or her classroom. So the regulation to enter the school system this each and every morning morning is very, very rigid in this school. So they have to go there. And this space in between is really, uh, let's say, strictly organized. So they go there, they are, they are, they can stay in within this yellow strip it, together with the, the classmates. And they are called one after another in group to enter the school system, right? So this is a very interesting, uh, let's say, form of regulation of the entrance uh, of a every morning. So why I'm so I'm insisting on this uh, picture because they uh, these pictures they show how the space in between the space in between family, meaning the ordinary life outside school, and the school system are very much regulated. So there is no real space to enjoy these, let's say, intermediate, you know, in between two things, school organized entrance routine in order to create less, less cows in order to, you know, to be well organized, they're going into that in group. While there are other uh, moments, other schools I visited where the situation is totally different. So you see here, it's a school nearby Rome, the capital, the, the Italian capital. It's not in my region, it's in another region, but I work it also in other schools. It's primary school, the same, the same you know, as before, the, the, the school before, but the entrance morning routine is totally different. So this means something. This means that this space in between is dif differently organized and, you know, a lot of people to interact uh, before the school morning starting in a different way. So I'm not just, ah, me, my, me as a student, I cannot just stick or stay with my classmates, but I can interact with other people, with other students into the school system before the school starts. So here you see in, the, in these pictures here into uh, your left side, uh, just, uh, kids of course i i have the uh, the, the permission to show <laughs> the permission to show right uh so i i okay with all the privacy etc um you you see just uh, um, kids or students are happily coming into the school system and there are some adults this is an important aspect there are some adults coming in and uh, this is maybe you may see some sort of Italian fashion, but there are adults helping the kids bringing um, uh, bags, etc. And he, this is another interesting pictures of two adults. One is the teacher with the the orange jacket, and that person is the mother uh, who is the delegate of the um, uh, parents. Uh, of that some classes. So we have uh, parents that may take the responsibility of being representative of parents' needs. So they go to school, they talk with the teachers, but this mother, they, I, I make, made observation many, many days, uh, almost one month in a row, 30, 30 days, so almost one month, and that lady, they spent spoke with the teacher almost every day. So there is an interesting uh, things here going on. So in this space in between family life and school life, there are many, many ways to regulate these, uh, let's say, um, uh, intermediate phases. Is, is school is not yet started, family is not yet there. I mean, families, family life is already, you know, home is already, we left home, we are going to school. So, you know, but in between these two things, a lot of things may happen. I may have uh, fun with my friend or not because I have to stick in my little box because I'm uh, the regulation. Or oh, my family may have daily access to the school or not, depending on, you know, 
what are how the border has been settled now again the notion of borders i i, I do hope with this empirical uh, presentation you may got the relevance of the borders so border might be extremely rigid you cannot have access you have to stick you only students may be may have access into the school system as in the yellow strip case now the a lot there is a big permeability so students may come in as uh, as they uh, 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 at their pleasure and they on the basis of what they want uh screaming not screaming running and not running and adults also so there is different access and different form of communication so the border are extremely permeable this means a lot of things this means how the family and the school may interact what kind of you know communication be possible on the basis of what so the um, border zone or the membrane as i called i prefer to call made uh, are interesting place to understand uh, the relationship between school and non-school system how they interact each other so if you want to understand what happens in the educational system you have to also re look at what are the border of this educational system and how they relate with the different places like school uh, territory other agencies uh, into the into the into the neighborhood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is um, a very simple example, but of course, it's not the only one example I may give you. So let me continue in order to uh, allow people to make some. Uh, uh, thought. I would like very much to have may, maybe some question or, or by the the people around. So. Uh, what are the importance of uh, social cultural borders, or if you may, I prefer to call them uh, social membranes in developmental educational processes. Borders are not, ju not just places, are not just, you know, territories. They are, they are psychological places. They are extremely important when it comes to education and when it comes to development. So the, in my view, the entire educational and developmental processes is a continuing crossing the border. So one border after another, after another, in order to get educated, in order to get a better education, in order to get a better development. So we all the time move, we all the time move from one border to another, to another, to another, in order to, to get education. So education means to work on the border of what is what already exists and what is not yet there, and now I'm let me show you um, an, uh, an uh, let's say uh, an, a couple of pictures for you to understand the importance of working on liminality, meaning working on the border, and this is something. This is a both a theoretical back truths and also methodological tools for future direction for Chinese uh, uh, work and together with, uh, let's say, the international partner, of course, this is a sort of possible program, um, a research program for the future. So this is a sort of vision we are sharing, working on liminality, working on borders when it comes to education. What does it mean working on borders? Meaning uh, working on uh, what we imagine, the imagined child, uh, you see the potentiality, what is not yet there, but may come in, a, in the future. So working on the border in education means working on what we have now and what we want to reach in the, in the next immediate um, moment. And for instance, as it has been shown in this uh, very nice picture, which is very simple one, but uh, it, uh, it's very powerful, this, uh, this uh, schema, because you see where the education uh, may take place. Education does not work in the state A here, because this is the starting point of our child. And let's say the child is doing A, B, C, D. Education doesn't work here because education, because the child already has this skill, this knowledge, these competencies. He already 
uh, you know, some, some has, is able already to do something. The education work exactly here into the next step, into what is not yet there, in the transition between state A and the next state. But when it comes to the state B, when the students has already acquired something, education, education is not longer working, working anymore. It's not there and there is no educational effort in the state B because the students is already achieved something. So education works only in between the state A and the state B. This is the place for us to work in the vague, vagueness, in the border zone, into the in-between zone, in the transition. So when, if someone asked me, where do you see the educational intervention? Here in the state A, no because it's already something that I have. I, I'm, do, I'm, I'm capable to do something already. I know something already. Uh, so, and the, the state B, no, there is already an ended point. It's something that I already acquired. The education is in between two things. So in between, the notion of in between us become extremely crucial when it comes to developmental and education. So we should move from the notion of, uh, let's say, um, the notion of being, we all the time in the school, we certify the competencies, we, we assess, we evaluate, we evaluate, we grade our students, but this is only half of, uh, of our story, all, only half of the coin, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the becoming, not the being. Being is ended. Being is not developmental. Being is not education. Becoming is education. The, the, the becoming, the process to be something else. This is the, the locus where we should um, uh, invest, we should make uh, research. So in the future, maybe we should work exactly in between the scaffolding activity that an adult do scaffolding is a term that has been uh, invented or used by Brunner in 1976. Scaffolding means all that uh, uh, infrastructure we build up, we build around the person who is growing or who is, who is getting education. It is a temporary help, uh, form of helping that we remove when the student is capable to do something. So you see, in between what he already knows and what he doesn't know yet, we should intervene. We, we should intervene there by using the scaffolding notion, making something exactly in this inter, inter, intermediate space, in this in-between space, what is the students is already knows and what is not yet there, but we can help by little, little uh, helps that uh, undergoes that has been labeled scaffolding. So scaffolding and zone of proximal development uh, as Vygotsky elaborated are notion that works exactly in this intermediate space, uh, uh, space. So again, just to summarize, to summarize and, and then we'll stop. Uh, cultural psychology has been extremely productive when it comes to education because it's uh, uh, it helps us to understand the processuality instead of just the end of the process, how the things happen. So cultural psychology and the mediation, the notion of mediation, the notion of science and the notion of science hierarchy and the notion of borders are become theoretically extremely important to understand the education in a new fashion, not just the education and the exit, the outcomes of an education, how I get educated, how I get the educated, how I, I get through the education, I get, uh, 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 I, I developed in my next stages, in my next phases. So in our theoretical understanding and also in our empirical work, we are very much interested in this in between, in these liminal spaces, because there you see the differences the, 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 the movement, uh, the becoming.
So this is what we, uh, Jan and I, Professor Tateo, we wanted to discuss with you. And because there are a lot, a lot, a lot of projects that are already uh, in place, uh, as I said, EBEF project, uh, the Center of Excellence, and also the Tandem Research Project, we are extremely, extremely happy of this uh, collaboration with uh, NCNU, especially with the group led by Professor Hemin and Professor Shawen and the, the incredible talented students there. So we're really uh, looking forward to continue our collaboration in the future. Thanks, thank you, and I'm here for any comments, any questions. Okay, thank you very much for uh, Professor Marcelo and also Professor Marcelo for such interesting topic about culture psychology. Uh, Professor Marcelo just uh, first introduced the program of IBEF and then uh, Professor Marcelo talked about the theoretic basis of this project and highlights the importance of the, uh, the in-between spaces or the liminal uh, spaces in this project. And furthermore, Professor Marcelo is talking about how the boundary or the so-called the boundary zone is so important for us to to uh, to discover to explore this uh, uh, productive uh, um, you know the in between um, places or the in this space in between you can see how the family life or social life were over uh, left or interacted uh, in this process. Actually, I'm very interested in this topic because I'm personally research on the rituals in school. And ritual is the very important or the very important theories to look through how these nimble uh, structures or, or places uh, take, uh, take place and how these students were understand their identities through this in between process. So thank you very much. Probably we can have more talk when you come to ECAU. Due to the time limited, and then I need to invite our discussant, Professor uh, He Ming, uh, as a discussant. Um, um, Associate Professor He Ming, she is uh, um, working at the ECAU and also, I guess, a part uh, of the project Silk Road. Huh? His research field, including the curriculum and instruction in kindergarten, as well as the kindergarten uh, teacher education. So let's welcome uh, Professor He Ming to give us some uh, comments. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to appreciate uh, uh, Pina and uh, Yang uh, for a very uh, short time to give the, the uh, presentation. And she clearly uh, gave us uh, uh, many information on cultural psychology and how to use in education. Uh, uh, she, um, I know uh, Pina is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, care about the border. And this time I think she used it as a um, uh, metaphor for um, in, in education, what's, what is education is, it's a transformation process uh, and connect uh, the, the children, the start uh, point to the social uh, point. Uh, so there are a lot of things we, uh, we can do and uh, many things are not so uh, determined. Uh, and uh, each of the culture have their own uh, way and uh, different uh, um, alternative ways to do. Uh, so I think the network of the cultural psychology, uh, they uh, try to find in different cultures, uh, what's the uh, uh, effective way to make uh, uh, education happen and make the children uh, develop it. So I am very much looking forward to invite uh, them to uh, ICNU again, uh, ICNU again, because uh, they, have, they can uh, organize very wonderful workshop uh, uh, not in this kind of uh, presentation <laughs> um, style. Uh, so I'm very looking forward to that. Uh, uh, that's what I want to see uh, today. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, actually, uh, the 
uh, discussion is open for the audience. If someone has any questions, you may just write down or hands up or write down the chat box, then we can translate it to Professor uh, Maseko. Huh? Anyone have questions, can just uh, uh, talk or have chat. Uh, write it down in the chat box. <laughs> Actually, I'm, nope. I'm very interested in your topic. Uh, I have been uh, well, research on the rituals in the education for years. I have been in Germany for uh, doing the ethnography for one year, and I found the rituals or the, the boundaries between the, the German schools are so different from China, uh, or so different from, the, from Shanghai. So, because you were also in Shanghai, so if there's any differences when you talk about this in between spaces it's a very broad and very general concept uh -huh. but uh based back to the uh, practice uh, how do you understand the culture differences between chinese in between spaces and the, the in between spaces, uh, in between spaces in european countries or european schools yeah yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, super interesting question. So, because it, it brings in uh, a very crucial aspects. So, uh, yeah, of course, there are differences in, in, in different cultural settings. Uh, as also Hemin has already pointed out, she really reframe uh, very clearly the, the contribution of cultural psychology. But cultural psychology is not basically interested in making comparison between uh, places, because this has been done over the last decades by the cross-cultural psychology or cross-cultural perspective, just making comparison in order to let's say, uh, in order to search for universalities. What we instead want to, uh, let's say, what, what we are interested in mostly is to understand how cultural component is, is contributed to, contributes to the formation of our mind. So what mm. I mean, uh, while I was in, in Shanghai, especially in Shanghai, uh, just to answer your question, because it's very, uh, extremely important to me too, uh, what I found is an extremely strategic way of use the space in between that I didn't find in Europe and in Latin America at all. So I oh. think, uh, yes, uh, there are the use of some spaces in between in many institutional uh, places, many school systems are corridors, are stairs, are entry halls, those places in which we really, we transit every day, but we really didn't take care of that much. I mean, they are considered a sort of no places. But as mm. I said, the borders or the border zone are not just no places, are places where something yeah. happens. So moving yeah. from one floor to another, moving from one floor to another is mm. means something. So, and I found an extremely interesting way, way of, uh, using or make use pedagogically and psychologically those places in between exactly in Shanghai district where all the ch many, many schools, uh, uh, they use this peripheral, uh, let's say, um, uh, stimuli as an, uh, a way to uh, teach something or giving mm -hmm. moral messages. So the mm -hmm. many, many corridors are filled by uh, messages that might be Either uh, pedagogical oriented numbers, uh, for instance, I, I have lot, took a lot of pictures, numbers or uh, with different, you know, or, or numbers or, or letters or um, uh, words, but also national sign or uh, let's say something yeah. that li is linked with the, the national, the feeling of being part of Chinese. Yeah, the collective. Uh, yeah, understand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in all the countries, I have been in many different countries, uh, not only in Italy, but also in Latin America, those, are, those uh, in between spaces are not uh, filled in such a way strategically filled, I mean, so they are not used as a pedagogical component that might, buy, that might give, um, uh, let's say, may provide uh, symbolic system, moral messages, et cetera, et cetera. So why I'm saying they are not just a matter of spaces, not, it's not just a matter of uh, strategic use of this or that, but this is something that filled our 
uh, our mind and we our mind interact daily with yeah. all these aspects symbolic aspects so you see there is no need for you know just yeah. uh, it's a, it's an interesting way of using the border zones in yeah. a different manner so yeah. i really I, uh, just coming back to your own research topic, I think rituals are extremely important aspects to study. The ritual of access, the ritual of uh, entering the school system, the ritual of the first day rituals, those yeah. are extremely important moments to study because it's really, you know, uh, uh, culturally speaking, they are extremely uh, crucial. Uh, they are yeah. terrific when it comes to uh, you know, the cultural component in our psychological functioning. So, yeah, I think we're great. <laughs> great. Then we can have more talk when you come to ECU. <laughs> we are expecting for that. Actually, there is another question from the uh, audience, but I don't think we have the time, time, enough time to, to talk about. But this is very interesting. Probably we can discuss that later huh? about how can we, because, you know, cultures, culture, between cultures, there were always boundaries. But nowadays, people were living in a globalized, globalization world. So how can we uh, you know to cut with in intercultural communication ability in school is another very important question in school field. I guess your theories about the cultural psychology may help us to explore this question more. So probably we can have a talk later on. huh? So thank you very much. Thank you, Marcelo and Wendy Schiff to the another speech uh, from the uh, real Miner. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot. Looking forward to meeting you again.